Welcome back to our Preparing for His Coming class. This is class number three. Uh, tonight we are going to be in Daniel chapter nine. Uh, this is one of my absolute favorite topics to teach on. It's a little bit um, hard to understand if you don't follow closely. So I pray that, that you'll be able to, to latch on and to not let go. Uh, let's look at Daniel chapter nine. Just the first few verses. It says, uh, At the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. So what Daniel, what happens to Daniel here is he is he has a light bulb moment. He is reading from the scriptures of Jeremiah, uh, and he understands, whoa, Jerusalem and Israel, we've been in captivity for 70 years, and we're about to see that come to an end. And he recognizes that he's going to be a part of that change. Uh, and it is a powerful moment for him. And it really, uh, it drives him uh, to his, his knees. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is as we study the topics that we're looking at uh, in regards to the second coming of Jesus, uh, we're trying to find out, okay, what signs, where are things pointing? Are we getting close? Or how should we uh, live? And what should we do to prepare for these things? Uh, the first thing is exactly what Daniel did, and that is we need to hit our knees in prayer. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that prayer here in just a minute, but uh, as he's reading this, uh, he understands that 70 years is coming uh, to a close. Now, I want to explain to you where did that, that 70 years came from, okay? Uh, turn in your, your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 26. And as, um, as we're turning there, uh, I'll explain a little bit. You know, we know that God instituted a Sabbath uh, during the week, that uh, uh, on the seventh day is a day of rest. Uh, when there's also a Sabbath of years. Every seventh year um, is to be a, a year of rest for the land. Uh, these Sabbaths God expected the Jewish people to keep. Uh, the, that seventh year is actually called a Shemitah. And here in Leviticus 26, verses 32 and 35, it says, I will bring the land to desolation, and your enemies who dwell in it shall be astonished at it. I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate and you are in your enemy's land. Then the land shall enjoy shall rest and enjoy its Sabbath. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest. For the time it did not rest on your Sabbath when you dwelt in it. And also in Second Chronicles um, chapter 2. Second Chronicles chapter 2 in uh, chapter 36. 36 verses 20 and 21. And those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So what has happened is God said, I want you to keep a Sabbath uh, every seventh year is to be a Sabbath year, a Shemitah, and the land is to lay uh, in rest. You're not to work it. That was also a year to release debt. The Shemitah actually means to release. It can also mean, however, uh, a fall or collapse. There's an interesting book. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Abilene, and I was able to hear a man, uh, some of you may know, by the name of Jonathan Kahn. Uh, he wrote a book called The Harbinger, uh, and he has just come out with a new book fairly recently called The Mystery of the Shemitah, and it deals with this seventh year Sabbath. Uh, and it was to be a, a time where uh, debts were released and the land was resting. But the Israelites did not keep that, that 
Shemitah. They did not keep the Sabbath of years. And so the Lord said, if you're not going to do it, I will do it. I will put you into captivity so that the land can rest. And so for every Shemitah that you did not keep, you're going to go into captivity. And that's what happened. And there were 70 of them. Uh, and that's why they were in captivity for 70 years. So Daniel realizes, whoa, <laughs> these 70 years are almost up. And so he hits his knees in prayer. He prays this wonderful prayer. Now, I'm not going to read it tonight, but I encourage you to read it. Uh, verses 4 through 19. I am going to tell you uh, what is said in that prayer, the Cliff Notes version of it anyway. Uh, Daniel prays, and, and he prays this wonderful, beautiful prayer for his country. It is an intercessory prayer. It's an, a prayer that, that sets the example for what we need to do when a country, and, and there are a lot of similarities between what was going on with, with Daniel and his people and what's going on in our country today, the United States of America. So he prays this prayer of intercession, and he says, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us because we have sinned. We have turned our backs against you. We have set ourselves upon us. And he says, shame belongs to us, but glory belongs to you. And he recognizes that we're there. They were in that situation because of their sin. And repentance was the only answer for it. Uh, and because if, even if they uh, were, were put back in the land and they continued in sin, that it would only happen again. So Daniel prays this wonderful prayer, and I encourage you to do the very same thing. As we re get prepared for the coming of Jesus, we recognize, boy, our country has, has strayed from the, the plan of God and from what God wants in our lives. Uh, and so, I, in fact, if you're interested, uh, I have a prayer, I did it about several years ago, uh, quite a few years actually, uh, and I, I use this prayer as a model, uh, Daniel's prayer, for our country today. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, those of you who are watching online, you can just send me an email at curtis at rootsbythestream.com and I will be glad to get you a copy of that prayer. But Daniel recognizes that God is their only hope and they've got to get things right with him. That's where we're at. But one of the things that I absolutely love about this prayer too is Daniel is someone who is in love with the Lord he, he lives for the Lord. He's not perfect by any means. But he has not turned his back on God. And yet, in this prayer, in this prayer, he includes himself. He's not sitting on this pedestal of judgment, pointing the finger at all the other Jewish people. He's saying, Lord, we have sinned. I have sinned. And that is where we've got to start. We cannot point the finger at everybody else. We've got to deal with us. Well, that's the only one that we can deal with. So each one of us needs to get our hearts right with the Lord and pray for our country, but not pray in, uh, as if we're better than everyone else, but include ourselves in there and start repenting. Repentance is so important, and it's one of those things that, um, boy, uh, our country is in desperate need of it, and uh, we are in desperate need of, of it as well. Now, the rest of Daniel chapter 9, uh, beginning in verse 20, uh, is really one of the most fascinating section of scriptures, at least to me, uh, in the entire Bible. Uh, let's read, uh, beginning in verse 20 of Daniel chapter 9. It says, Now while I was speaking, praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me, and he said, O Daniel, I have come forth to give you skill to understand. Um, at the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Now, he's going to give him a vision uh, that's amazing. But before we get to that, that vision and that prophecy, I just want to point something out to you here. Daniel has been praying, and uh, even before this prayer that he prayed uh, regarding Israel, he's been praying, and Gabriel is sent in response to that prayer. And, and he comes to him, and he says, I want to tell you something. You're greatly beloved. The Lord sees you. 
He's heard your cry, and he has sent me in response to that. He also says, in verse 22, he says, I have come forth to give you skill to understand. And I, I need to tell you right now that there are some things in the Word of God that are beyond our understanding. It's just a simple fact. Uh, we've got to have a heavenly revelation, an understanding of it. Uh, and even, we're in a better situation than, than Daniel was at because Jesus said, I am leaving so that the helper can come, the counselor, the one who will lead you into all truth, and that's the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us, and he will guide us, he will teach us, and he will lead us. So anytime that you're reading something in the Word of God, I encourage you to pray and ask Holy Spirit to guide you and to teach you things uh, about what you're reading. Because there are some things, just like Daniel was in this situation, he could not understand it on his own. But with the, the help of the Lord, uh, and with this angel that the Lord sent for him to reveal these things, uh, he could. So I just encourage you, sometimes, yeah, there's going to be some difficult things to understand. And, and I'm going to tell you, uh, probably in a, a couple of weeks, I'm going to tell you a story uh, that happened to me in, in studying the book of Revelation. And it was just something that I, I, I didn't understand, and it, I, it seemed like I couldn't understand it. But the Lord helped me, and it was only through him that I was able to understand it, and I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. So this is what uh, Gabriel tells Daniel, verses 24 through 27. He says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and your, for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Uh, and some have the most holy place. Uh, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. And the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Um, and after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, for, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with the flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end of sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Now that's a, a mouthful uh, to read and to understand. But I, I want to go back to the very beginning of this uh, in verse 24. He says, 70 weeks are determined for you and for your people. Now, that word weeks uh, is actually it just means seven. So he says, 70 sevens are determined. So what does that mean? Uh, in the context here and, and how the, the Jewish uh, scholars as well as Christian scholars as well uh, interpret it, it is 70 sets of seven years. So you have 490 years uh, that cover this prophecy. It has a beginning point and an ending point. Um, who is it for? Who is this prophecy for? This prophecy is specifically for Daniel and for his people. So this centers around Israel. Uh, and as we will come to find out in this study, if you don't already know it, God is not finished with Israel right now. And he has a plan for Israel. Uh, and it, it's we're going to see it tonight where, uh, yes, just like they were in 70 years of captivity, uh, they did something that God uh, turned from them to the Gentiles. But he is still going to pull them back, and this prophecy is going to be part of it. So let's look at this. He says this, this prophecy, this time, in this 490 years, uh, it's to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the, the, each one of these specifically. But while Jesus came and he did some of these things as a whole, Israel did not accept him as a nation. And that's important because Jesus said that 
I am not going to return. He was talking to his people. He said, I'm not going to return until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, until you're willing to accept me. And there's going to be a time where the, the true Israel, not just everyone that lives in Israel, but true Israel recognizes Jesus as the Messiah. In fact, uh, there's a lot going on in Israel right now. Uh, people, Jewish people, are having their eyes open to accept Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, they're from, Israel became a nation in 1948. And in 1948, um, it fulfilled a prophecy in Isaiah 66, uh, it's either eight verses, verse 8 or verse 10, that says, can a nation be born in one day? And Israel was born in one day. It's the only nation on the planet uh, that has ever had that happen in that way. Uh, truly amazing. But there were very few, from 1948 to 1967, very few Messianic Jews. And what that means is Jewish people who have accepted Jesus as their Messiah. They're still Jewish. They haven't changed. Just like the Jewish people of the, the New Testament that we read about. They were still Jewish. Uh, they still went to synagogues. They still kept the Sabbath. But they had accepted Jesus as their Messiah. So, but from 1967 until now, something has been happening in Israel uh, and throughout the earth uh, of all of the Jewish people. But in Israel specifically, uh, there were a handful, maybe 15, 20 uh, along at the beginning of, of Israel coming back. But now, there's somewhere, and nobody knows for sure, but there's somewhere between 30 and 50,000 Messianic Jews in Israel. In fact, just a few weeks ago, there was a conference that was held there, and uh, there, was, there were about 550 non-Messianic Jews. These were just Jewish people that had not accepted Jesus. And at the end of this conference, God had done something in them, and 525 of them gave their life to the Lord, and that is truly amazing. The Lord is working, and he is doing a, a, an amazing uh, thing over in Israel right now. So this prophecy is for them. It, it says, yes, you're going to be the ones that are, are going to see these things. Uh, vision and prophecy have not, uh, there have been, I grew up in a church that, that taught that that was fulfilled, that we don't have any vision and prophecy. But even if you take, if you don't believe that people have visions, and that people can prophesy today. Look at it this way. All of prophecy has not been fulfilled because Jesus has not come back for his second coming. So we're still waiting for that to be fulfilled uh, in the future. Now, this has a starting point uh, for us in verse 25. He says, Therefore know and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven sevens and 62 sevens. Okay, so we're going to have a starting point right here that is a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Okay, now as we go along this journey, he says there's going to be Seven sevens, which is 49 years, and there's a marker there, and then 62 sevens. So these two combined are going to be 483 of the 490 years, okay? What we have to determine is where this decree started so that we can know, um, so we can keep track of those 490 years. Do we have a record of that decree? Well, some people try to make it uh, in Ezra chapter 1 and Ezra chapter 6. Ezra 1, 1 through 4, you don't have to, to turn there right now, but Ezra 1, 1 through 4 and Ezra 6, 3, there were decrees that were issued, but those decrees were to rebuild the temple. The decree that we're looking for, based off of what Gabriel tells Daniel here, is a decree to rebuild, restore, and rebuild Jerusalem. Okay? He also says that this, this will happen uh, during a time uh, of trouble. 
during troublesome time. And we know that to be Nehemiah. Nehemiah was, uh, you know, they were fighting at a sword in one hand and a hammer in the other. And uh, they were trying to build and defend at the same time. So let's look over at Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. It says, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took wine and I gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. And therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad, since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. Now, Nehemiah is a cupbearer to the king, and they were not allowed to show emotion before the king. They were supposed to just be kind of um, stoic, and, and you could get in serious trouble if you did. And so uh, Nehemiah is, is afraid because the king has noticed his sadness. And this is what he said to the king in verse 3. He says, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lie, lies waste? and its gates are burned with fire. Then the king said to me, What do you request? And so I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may, be, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, and the queen also sitting beside him, How long will your journey be, and when will you return? And so it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. And he goes on to send letters to different people, uh, to, of decrees to, to say, uh, release the necessary provision for this to be done. But this specifically was to rebuild Jerusalem. And this is the decree that we're looking for. This is the decree that, uh, that starts everything. And that's in Nehemiah chapter 2, 1 through 8. So that's the countdown. The countdown didn't start when this was given to Daniel. The countdown started when Artaxerxes uh, released that decree, issued that decree, uh, I believe it was around 445 B.C. So from that point forward, we're looking for 49 years and something to happen there. And what happened there is that was pretty much when, the, uh, when Jerusalem had been restored and they dedicated the temple. Jerusalem is restored. And so then we have 483 years combined with this next, uh, with the 7 and the 62 together. That leaves us uh, with a very specific number of days. 173,880 days. Now, one thing we need to talk about right here is that 490 years for, for this prophecy is different than what we might think. We, might, we would think of it in 365-day years. For them, this is a 360-day year. Uh, it's a prophetic year. How do I know that? Because when you look in Daniel, uh, excuse me, in Revelation, uh, and also you'll find it in Daniel, but in Revelation, uh, there's going to be a seven-year period. We're going to look at it here in just a little bit. A seven-year period that's broken up into two halves, three and a half years. Uh, it is described in several different ways. One of the ways that it's described is in uh, a time, times, and half a time, okay? Uh, or three and a half years, or 42 months, or 1,260 days. All of those describe those two halves of the seven years, Okay? If you divide 1,260 days by 360, which is the prophetic years, you get three and a half years. So we know that when God's dealing with prophecy, he's using a calendar of 360 days. So 360 days times 483 years is 173,880 days until there is a huge event that this points to Messiah. This verse says, from the issuing of the decree until Messiah the Prince, 
there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. Now, I'm going to step aside just for a moment. It's going to connect, uh, but it'll be a little bit before we connect back to it. You know, when I was growing up, there was a mystery. Uh, and even as an adult, it was an, a mystery to me. Uh, in Matthew chapter 9, uh, we're going to see this begin. And there's quite a few verses that, that go along with it. Um, and, and this may be where you're at. You may have read some of these verses and been like, I do not understand this. So hopefully, if that's you, we're going to bring some clarity to that. Matthew chapter 9 in verse 30. Now Jesus has just healed two blind men. And in verse 30 it says, And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. This is puzzling for me. Jesus just healed two men. Why in the world is he sternly warning them, Don't tell anybody about this. Don't let anyone know it. Matthew 16, verse 20. Now this is where um, Jesus has just asked Peter, who do men say that I am? Uh, and then he asks Peter, who do you say that I am? And, and he tells him that uh, upon the rock of those who follow him and his name, he's going to build his church. And then he says in verse 20, then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. He's just made this big declaration about how he's going to build the church upon them. And he says, but don't tell anybody who I am. Mark chapter 1. Mark 1 verses 43 and 44. Now here Jesus has just healed a leper. And in Mark 1, uh, 43, he says, And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once. And he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for yourself cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So he says, You've been healed of leprosy. Now there is a process that you need to go, go through in order for people to recognize you as being clean. Go to the priest, present yourself, but don't tell anyone about what has happened here. Now, in verse 45, it says, However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely uh, and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city. Uh, and then in uh, Mark chapter 5 now, Mark 5, 43, Jesus has just healed uh, a little girl. And in verse 43, he says, But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, and said that something should be given to her to eat. So again, we see him saying, Don't let anyone know about this. Mark 7, 36. Jesus heals a, a man who is deaf and mute. And it says, Then he commanded them, in verse 36, He commanded them that they should tell no one. But the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. Now, two more. Luke chapter 4, verses 40 and 41. This is a really interesting one to me, a little bit different than some of the ones that we had just read there. Uh, Luke 4, 40 and 41 says, When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them, and he healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. That's fascinating to me. Uh, one more time, we see Jesus, not just with people, but now with demons who are, uh, they may be mocking him, but they're declaring who he is, and he's not allowing them to. Now the last one is in John chapter 7. John 7, verse 
verses 2 through 8. It says, Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand, and his brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. So they're trying to get him to reveal himself and to say, look, this is who I am. Because they were even having doubts. Verse 6, then Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not, not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. Now, there are two things at work in, in what he's saying here. One is that this is the Feast of Tabernacles. And when we get to the, our study of the feast, because we're going to find out that Jesus fulfilled the spring feast at his first coming. And he will fulfill the fall feast at his second coming. The Feast of Tabernacles is one of the fall feasts. So one of the reasons he's not going to the Feast of Tabernacles is because he, it's not the time for him to fulfill it. The other thing is, he says, it's, my time has not yet fully come. And that is where we get to um, with the mystery of why he is telling people, don't let anyone know uh, who I am. Turn over to Luke chapter 19, and we're going to hopefully solve this mystery. Luke 19, verses 28 through 40. When he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he drew near Bethage and Bethany, at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, uh, where you will enter, uh, and you will find a coat tied, a colt tied on it, which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it, just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to, said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as they went, many spread their clothes on the road. And then as, uh, then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King. Now some translations have Hosanna in the highest. Well, I say translations. Other gospels have uh, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. You see, we read this and sometimes I think we, we don't understand what is really happening here. As Jesus, this is a special day. This was the day that was pointed to from the issuing of that decree until Messiah the Prince. There was a specific day when Jesus would declare himself as the Messiah. It was a day that all of Israel was to be looking for and ready for. And so as he's coming down the descent of Mount, the Mount of Olives, and he's on a colt, and, and this is such a, a special, it's like a kingly moment. This is not him just walking uh, into the town. They have they don't even let him sit on a colt that anyone else has ridden. They put their clothes over the colt. They begin to put their clothes on the road in front of him. And the disciples have palm branches, and they're waving those palm branches, and they're saying, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And what they're doing, uh, the, the word Hosanna means save now. So what they're doing is they're declaring Jesus to be the Messiah. And they're saying, Jesus, you are the Messiah. Save us now. Now you can see how that would make the Pharisees very uncomfortable. And, and they, they, they tell Jesus, Jesus, tell your disciples to shut up. Jesus says, no, you don't understand. This is the day you were supposed to be looking for. And if they're silent, the very rocks are going to cry out today. He goes on uh, to tell us a little bit more. Verse 41, after this has taken place. It says, now he drew near and he saw the city and he wept over it. 
saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Wow. Jesus says, this is the day that you should have known about. This is the day that was prophesied to Daniel, and you had a very specific day. It should have been taught to the children and their children and their children, and there was an appointed time for Jesus to declare himself as the Messiah. He was the Messiah throughout his time on earth, and people put two and two together as they saw what he did. Jesus even went to Nazareth uh, and sat in the seat that was reserved for the Messiah, and he read from the scriptures, and he told them, the, this scripture has been fulfilled in your presence today. And, and so for his own hometown, he declared himself to be the Messiah. But he was doing it to fulfill a prophecy that he would be rejected for, by his own hometown. Uh, and uh, now he has declared it to the entire nation. He has come in. The triumphal entry was so significant for the entire nation. And then afterwards, can you imagine what it would have been like, even knowing that they were going to, to know that they weren't ready. To know the people that you love and you care about and you have poured out everything for them, that they have rejected you. Yes, there were some who were there for him, but the entire nation was supposed to be there for him. And they missed it. And he says, because you missed it, he's weeping tears, and he says, because you missed it, now it's been hidden from your eyes. And now you're going to have some severe consequences coming because of this. Now, praise the Lord, because of their missing it, he has turned to the Gentiles, and now we've been grafted in. But if you read Romans 11, you better be really careful to, not, to understand that God is not finished with Israel yet. And we'll look at Romans 11 when we uh, look more in detail with, with Israel. But this was the day of their visitation, the day. It's an amazing prophecy to me to understand that, that he knew the end from the beginning, and that God is, to me, it's a reminder of how awesome he is, the power that he has, and that he knew before Jesus, of course, we know that he was slain from the foundation of the earth. The plan all along was to send Jesus because the Lord God knew that our sin would separate us from him. But he said, I know the exact day that you will have your Messiah presented to you. And they should have as well, but they missed him. Now, back to the prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. He says, From the issuing of the decree until Messiah the Prince, there's going to be 483 years. Okay, 69 of the 70 sets of seven years are going to be fulfilled. And there are some people that try to say that uh, it was continuously fulfilled. Uh, and that would make sense uh, except for a few things. One, verse 26 says that after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Okay? So after, we're already, we've already finished with these 69. And after this, I got the wrong color there. After this, Messiah is cut off. That's the crucifixion. Okay, so if we're in the middle of the, the 70th week, the last seven years, uh, you would think that it would tell us. But it says, after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Jesus went to the cross... Not for him, but for us. We, we had to have him pay the price for our sin. And then it says, And the people of the prince who is to come, we'll talk about who that prince is in just a minute, 
shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, now we have a problem because Jerusalem and the sanctuary were not destroyed until uh, 70 A.D. Well, that didn't take place uh, until a good chunk of time uh, after Jesus had already ascended back into heaven. So if we're talking about a seven-year period, there has to be some kind of a gap because we're told here when that last seven years begins. And it hasn't begun yet, according to him, until at least 70 AD. But we're going to find out that that wasn't the, the place either. So the, the people of the prince who is to come, that was the Roman people, uh, and most likely that is referring to the Antichrist or the false prophet, which we'll talk about it in depth uh, later on. Uh, and so some form of Roman Empire is going to be at the end of this because it says um, the, the city is destroyed, the sanctuary is destroyed. It says the end shall be with the flood until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Now listen to verse 27. Then... He, who is he, the prince who is to come, uh, not Jesus, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week or one seven-year period, okay? That's known as the 70th week of Daniel. He shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Now, some people have tried to make this Jesus, okay? Uh, because Jesus, we, we don't have to offer sacrifices anymore because of his sacrifice. He, and, and that's true. But here, this is not what he's talking about. Because here, Jesus did this. He made a, brought an end to sacrifice and offering at the cross. Then we've had the gap, at least until 70 AD, when the destruction of Jerusalem was. Also, the covenant that Jesus made with us was not a seven-year covenant, thankfully. It's an everlasting covenant. It's an eternal covenant. It doesn't just last seven years. So, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. Now, and even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. This is really complicated language. Uh, some translations make it a little bit easier to understand. They talk about the abomination of desolation. What the abomination of desolation is, uh, is a time when the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple of God. You'll read about it in Daniel. You'll read about it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You'll read about it in Revelation. And he sets himself up in the temple of God and he proclaims himself to be God. Um, that abomination of desolation, uh, many people will try to tell you that it was a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes, he fulfilled a lot. And we've talked about this just uh, briefly uh, when we were talking about the near-far implications of uh, as we look at Scripture. He fulfilled a lot of what Daniel said, especially in Daniel chapter uh, 11. Uh, he fulfilled a lot of it. But we know that it is still future. Why? Because of what Jesus said in Matthew 24. Jesus said, when you see sitting in the holy place the abomination of desolation, if you live in Judea, you get out of there. You run, you flee. And he puts it in a future context. Now, the abomination of desolation, and you're going to find out that there was no people, the, the preterists will try to tell you that this took place in the destruction of Jerusalem. You will not find a seven-year covenant that was signed or confirmed. You will not find an abomination of desolation. They'll try to tell you that it was Nero, uh, and they'll try to convince you in a lot of different ways that it's already been uh, fulfilled, but it hasn't. It's future, and that seven-year period, known as the 70th week of Daniel, is what we are about, we are approaching, that we are getting close to starting. And we're looking for a, a covenant, just like we had the decree to start this, we're looking for a covenant to be signed, most likely a peace treaty with Israel, okay? And it's going to be a covenant signed with many, possibly many nations are going to be involved in this. But that is what starts the countdown on the last seven years uh, leading up to the return of Jesus. And, and we're going to look at that very much in detail as we come. I hope that, uh, that this has given you a better understanding of 
this prophecy and uh, possibly about uh, the mysteries of Jesus trying to, to, to tell people not to tell him about it, I do recognize that this is a challenging subject. So if you have questions, please feel free uh, to email me at curtis at rootsbythestream.com and I will do my best to, to answer any questions that you have. Thank you for joining us. Next week we are going to be looking uh, at the seven churches. No, excuse me. Uh, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 1 and then the week after that we're going to be looking at the seven churches. So I hope you'll uh, join us then as well. Thank you.